Uh, is this, if this is your first workshop, welcome. If this is one of several that you've been to, welcome back. We appreciate your participation. Uh, tonight's workshop will be Urban Soils and Eco Justice uh, with Scott Kellogg. We're very excited to have him, and I had a chance to read a little bit about the workshop, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, we have a few small housekeeping items, and I'll give the controls over to him. First off, uh, these workshops and our entire conference is being sponsored by some wonderful sponsors that have been very generous in uh, donating. Um, you're seeing some of our gold sponsors right now. I will not name them all, but uh, if you can check them out in our program book, along with our other vendors. These are our silver sponsors that you're looking at. Both the gold and silver sponsors have generously sponsored this workshop, all the other workshops and the conference in general, and we are very grateful to them. And lastly, we wanted to give honor and pay homage to those that have inhabited the lands that were on, um, that were managed uh, before colonization, before European occupation. These are our First Nation families that uh, was throughout the region from wherever you are viewing this workshop. I'm actually broadcasting to you from Springfield, Massachusetts in Western Mass, where the Potomac people um, pretty much were from Deerfield all the way to the Connecticut border. Uh, you can use this map that you see here and I will put uh, this, this website in the chat so you can look up uh, the tribes that were in your area and we always wanna pay honor to our First Nations family uh, who were here before the Europeans arrived. So that is all that I have at this point. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, turn things over to Scott because he has a very exciting workshop and please enjoy um, and just keep those questions going. Scott, I turn it over to you. All right, great. Yeah, my name is Scott Kellogg. I'm the educational director at the RADIX, R-A-D-I-X, Ecological Sustainability Center, which is a nonprofit organization based in Albany, New York, where we are creating an urban environmental education center, a demonstration site of sustainable tools and technologies designed to teach urban residents with a special focus on youth how to have more local access and control over essential resources such as food and water and waste management, energy production, with an emphasis on designing systems that are simple and affordable with the goal of coming up with a model that is transferable to cities throughout the country and the world. So we've got a one acre farm right in the middle of the city that contains systems such as a greenhouse, multiple gardens, chickens, micro livestock ponds, honeybees, aquaponics, rainwater collection systems, a whole variety of systems that we use to teach ecological literacy. The idea of teaching youth how to have greater familiarity with many of the systems that you know we depend upon for food production, for water, for waste management, energy production, that many times as a consequence of living in cities we tend to be disconnected from. And although we may be surrounded by farms and fields on the vicinities, if, for instance, you don't have a car, those aren't going to necessarily be accessible to you, despite the fact that we have a relatively small urban to rural gradient in Albany. So focusing a lot on programs for youth, we've actually in the middle right now of a summer program that's called Pandemic Resilience and Climate Justice, which it involves or has involved um, 15 AmeriCorps employees who just finished up this past Friday, but that's been overlapping also with our summer youth employment program that's done through City of Albany that provides stipends for local youth to be working on the site. And we've really been focusing on addressing the challenges of the pandemic head on, which as we know has really laid bare a lot of the systemic inequalities that have been existing all along. It's allowed us to see them a bit more clearly and to try and work to address them, addressing food security, food access issues, as well as climate justice, environmental justice, working with a lot of other community organizations to help distribute food, but also planting up a lot of food as well and really trying to see the opportunity in the crisis to, to draw attention to these inequalities, but also to do work to 
build a greater resilience overall and create greater fairness and equity and access for all the community members. So that's been really exciting to be involved in that. That program then runs throughout the year where we have youth coming in from about four to six in the afternoons, helping with gardening, doing a lot of fun and education, uh, teaching about local environmental justice issues. So that uh, occupies a huge amount of the work that we're doing. Um, here's some examples of youth coming in for community building events. So I wanna be talking a little bit about our overarching philosophy and the how and the why of what we do. Sustainability, as we know, it's about, in theory, or at least in its original def definitions about the overlap of environmental, social, and economic issues. But what we've seen occur increasingly as of late is the exclusion of the social pillar of sustainability, where issues pertaining to race and class and equity and justice and fairness get marginalized in favor of a greater emphasis put on, on economic issues. So we really wanna be explicit in our work about recentering the so-called social pillar of sustainability and thinking about, for instance, how do issues pertaining to the urban ecosystem, such as its soils, its water, its waste producing processes, and its non-human life, its, its biodiversity and its biocultural diversity, how do these pertain to, to the social sphere? How do these pertain to issues of race and class and equity and fairness? So really trying to be deliberate about recentering that work. Um, focusing it particularly in environmental justice context where in the south end of Albany, there is frequently communities of color and low income communities which are suffering disproportionately from exposure to polluting industries. So drawing attention to that and really coupling it with what we call the just sustainability paradigm, which is to look at the urban sustainability movement and then also the environmental justice movement and looking at how these tend to be demographically different. Environmental justice, historically low income communities, colors, and while a lot of urban sustainability and environmental conservation movements tend to be more affluent and white. And looking at that demographic divide and looking at like what are the issues that they actually share in common and how can these two groups come together to be promoting environmental amenities for all residents of the cities, right? So we want to look at the, take the environmental justice framework, which looks at the inequitable distribution of environmental risks of harms, but we also want to be advocating for equitable distribution of environmental goods and services, such as green space and community gardens and public transportation, and, and doing it in such a way where it doesn't result in an increase of people's property values and their ultimate displacement. So really trying to walk some careful lines there, but having conversations about that type of complexity. So um, yeah, we have only got a little bit of time here, but I wanna talk a little bit about our framing of cities as ecosystems, um, and particularly with our focus on soil today, uh, how we like to think of them. Really, I mean, when we're thinking about cities and as ecosystems, we define ecosystems as being communities of organisms interacting with the living and non-living aspects of their environments. And in that regard, cities meet those definitions. They are not necessarily what we call healthy or high functioning ecosystems, but once we can identify them as that, we can ask how they can be improved to be better. So currently as it is now, we have like flow paths of energy, food and water and goods coming to cities and then being spit out as emissions, pollution at the other end that tend to concentrate in the soil and water and air in the near vicinity of cities. Uh, this is really represented clearly in the city of Albany as there are typically miles and miles of the proverbial bomb trains leading into the cities as one of these linear flow paths of, in this case, crude oil, which not only you know poses a threat for explosive derailment, but also just people's cr uh, chronic exposure to toxic emissions from these trains and how they are often situated next to public housing and low income uh, neighborhoods. And really what we want to try to be focusing on doing is trying to to close that loop, to make it so cities can be producing more of their resources internally, collecting the rainwater, processing their waste is really important as well. Um, but at the same time, not making it too tight of a loop too. We always want to maintain good interchange with the surrounding rural communities as well. We really want to challenge the urban versus rural dichotomy that often gets created 
and emphasize how urban communities and rural communities can be in solidarity with one another. Um, just jumping ahead through a couple images here, just in the interest of time, but a um, quick tour of some of uh, the systems in our greenhouse. We have an, an aquaponic system where we raise fish and plants together, uh, which is really at this point, mostly a cool teaching system that I use with kids to teach them about aquatic systems and aquatic cycles and help them retain a connection to aquatic environments, which many times the cities we tend to be disconnected from, especially in the case of Albany, the Hudson River, which we've constructed an interstate that runs parallel to and made it difficult for anyone to access. So a big part of what we do is really just bringing kids down to the river and, and trying to help them develop a, a relationship based on, on reciprocity and love and, and mutual concern with the well-being of the river. And aquaponics is one way to do that, where we can, for instance, talk about the fact that there's been a ban on eating fish out of the river since the 1970s on account of the PCBs that have accumulated in it. But when we're controlling inputs such as food and water, we can be relatively sure the fish are going to be non-toxic. At the same time, being clear that this is not a techno fix, that we don't want to say, oh, the river is hopelessly polluted. Now we have to raise all our fish in tanks. That's not where we want to go. We want to say, this is something that we're doing as an interim strategy while we're simultaneously working to restore the health of fisheries in the river so that one day that may be swimmable and fishable and capable of providing city residents with their needs once again. Um, quick uh, run through some images there. Uh, working a lot around waste cycles and, and waste processes in cities. Uh, here's actually um, a warm bin. We work pretty closely with Giffen Elementary, which is an elementary school right around the corner from us, public school, where we sort of create ecosystems in the classroom. Uh, you can see in the, the lower right, there's an image of microgreens, which we grow in windows with kids where they can go through the process of planting and harvesting within a three-week cycle and then feed the leftover roots to worms who will eat the, the leftover seeds and the roots and turn them back into soil that can get used for the, the next round of planting. Um, but, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on this in cities where, you know, when we're looking at obstacles to food production, gaining access to land is a significant obstacle. But in addition to the fact is the fact that urban soils tend to be non-existent or degraded or contaminated uh, for any number of variety of reasons. And really the remedy to any of those issues is to be creating as much compost as we possibly can, to be building soil where it doesn't exist, to be regenerating its health where it's been damaged and degraded, and to be used to be reducing the biological availability of heavy metal contaminants where it's been polluted or to create a physical barrier to prevent people from coming into contact with them. Or in the case of organic pollutants, oil-based pollutants to be creating microbially diverse soil ecosystems which can work to facilitate the breakdown of pollutants in the ground. So yeah, right now in cities, a huge percentage of the food that is produced goes into the landfill where of course it breaks down into methane, which is driving climate change significantly. And we really wanna be intercepting that food and composting it on the surface of the planet. So this is um, a hierarchy to reduce food waste and grow community schema that's developed by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that I like to emphasize uh, to demonstrate a lot, really particularly in contrast to the similar schema that's used by the EPA, because I really like this one, how it, it's similar to the EPAs in that it emphasizes source reduction and edible food rescue is the top two tiers, which are, are really important, certainly, right? That we don't want to be composting food that's still good enough for people to eat. We want to get that into the hands of hungry people. But this pyramid emphasizes the small scale, home scale, and decentralizing composting over centralized anaerobic digesters. And that's a point I really like to emphasize is that there is a huge potential to use food waste to address environmental justice issues. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to model at the Radix Center. We collect food waste from a number of different places, from local food pantries that are around the corner from us that go around to supermarkets three days a week and collect a bunch of food that's get, about to get thrown out. They give it away for free. We go get whatever's left over, bring it to the Radix Center. We also have free drop-off sites where people can leave their food wastes. We also have a collection service where people 
uh, will pay us uh, $15 a month to go around and collect their food scraps curbside. And we use an electric bike that pulls a cargo trailer that you see right here to do that collection, which is basically a low cost, zero emissions vehicle. Doesn't produce any particulate emissions, which is particularly important in urban environments where you have vulnerable populations with respiratory illnesses that we really want to minimize their exposure to air pollutants. So um, what do we do with all that food waste that we collect? We bring it down and we feed it to our army of about 30 or 40 chickens and ducks who do an amazing job of eating that food waste and turning it into chicken manure, which we then will use in our gardens. We dig it all out and let it sit aside and age for a period of time and then use that to grow nutrient dense food for our urban populations. So, um, sorry, just gonna jump ahead through a couple of things here in the interest of time to focus on soil. Um, like we mentioned, to go a little more depth about this, how urban soils tend to be non-existent or degraded. Uh, often they're sealed, covered by asphalt or concrete, which create in, impermeable barriers. And this is gonna be really interesting. We're gonna see this happen tomorrow as the tropical storm passes overhead. A huge amount of rainfall in a very short period of time. When it hits that impervious material, it rushes off and overwhelms our sewer systems, like you see right here, producing what's called a combined sewage overflow which creates a huge amount of pollution in the river. We've done a lot of work to address that. But one of the good things, really important things that can be done is try and remove that impervious layer, try and remove that asphalt, remove that concrete. Though the thing is, once that's taken up, there's often compacted soil underneath, made incredibly hard um, by years of trucks driving across it. And it has an absorptive capacity that's maybe slightly better than asphalt. So we really wanna try and loosen that up as well by using trees, by using plants, by using uh, daikon radish, what would you call bio, bio drills to actually try and break up that hard pan of soil, uh, but also building up, building up on top of that soil level so that um, plants can grow in it once again. Um, but you know, another challenge I briefly mentioned is that of, of pollution, which is uh, a major concern in urban areas, particularly with lead, which is a ubiquitous contaminant, which um, is a neurotoxin, particularly harmful to children when they come into contact with it, resulting from lead-based paint, from uh, auto exhaust. Uh, another great thing that you can do with compost is to apply it to soil and the lead will actually bound, bind with the molecular structure of the compost to reduce what's called its biological availability. So that if it is accidentally ingested or inhaled, it's less likely to stick to receptor sites in your brain and reduces its, its potency as a neurotoxin. So that's another one of the strategies that we use. Furthermore, we're big advocates of mushroom production for a number of reasons. One, to uh, grow a food for market and for consumption, to uh, grow a crop in marginal spaces, uh, other barriers to food production in cities, the fact that many vacant lots don't get enough sunlight to support vegetable production. We also have a lot of post obsolete post-industrial spaces, old factories and warehouses that can be used for mushroom productions because unlike plants, they don't need sunlight for photosynthesis. So here we are growing oyster mushrooms um, on the shade of a balcony. And we actually have a ton, we have our youth producing shiitake logs right now in an old warehouse, which has got all kinds of leaks in it right now. It's very humid, but that happens to make it actually a very good place for, for mushroom production. The really cool thing about that though is that after you grow the mushrooms and you harvest the mushrooms, the leftover material, what's called the substrate, is loaded with enzymes which can be used to break down organic pollutants in the soil, things like oil uh, or gasoline or chlorinated solvents or BTEX compounds or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or any number of different compounds that may be in the soil. So the way you can do this is to grow mushrooms on a material like this that you know to be clean, take the leftover material which has the enzyme still present in it and spread it across an area that you suspect or know to be contaminated and the rains will wash those residual enzymes into the soil where they'll break down those pollutants. And in that way, you don't have to ask, worry about growing mushrooms in contaminated material. This way, you're only using the byproduct to promote the regeneration of contaminated soils. And in that way, we're creating 
a ecologically regenerative sustainable micro industry where we're trying to hinge sustainable practices onto an economic engine. We're trying to create jobs for youth, uh, growing food for the community and using the byproduct to repair the, the legacy of toxicity that's been handed down to us. Um, so yeah, that's a quick summary of what we're doing. Oh, I should also mention, yeah, we're doing a lot of lead testing within the city. We've recently been able to acquire a device called an XRF that allows us to do um, basically screen up and down the periodic table. So one of the services we've been offering is um, doing free lead screening for people from the backyards to just bring in Ziploc bags of soil. And it removes one of the barriers uh, to getting your soil tested, whereas they might otherwise have to mail off soil to Cornell or UMass and, and pay a fee for testing. We're uh, trying to offer that at low or no cost. So yeah, a lot of different programs that we have going on and um, excited to have you all come and visit us someday. We are still taking visitors. We've been able to run our program all the summer. I've been really excited uh, to be able to do that. I mean, really as a farm, even as everything got shut down with coronavirus, we were regarded as essential and we're allowed to continue to be able to operate. So we've had a group of 30 plus people down there all summer outdoors wearing masks and socially distancing and really working to address the um, the challenges of the pandemic and also you know with with the growth of the and of the black lives matter movement really just shining a light on systemic racial injustices and using that as well to to draw attention to so many of these systemic inequalities that have been ongoing and um really trying to um yeah, address these multiple challenges. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, anybody has any with the time remaining. You can just put them in the... Yes, please. Um, for those who have questions, place them in the chat. I do have a few questions to get it started off, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone else, please feel free. Um, you're also invited to take yourself out off a of mute after these few questions said to pose your question as well. Um, you mentioned the, just recently, you have a device that you can use to assist um, with lead testing yeah. uh, in backyard gardeners. Can you um, go into more detail on that? And give sure. Us more information? It's, it's called an XRF, which stands for X-ray fluorescence. And it's a machine that's able to pretty much test up and down the periodic table. So we could test for anything you would find on a periodic table. So that includes lead, mercury, cadmium, nickel, arsenic, a lot of the, the heavy metals that are often contaminants of concern in urban soil. So we can, we can test for all those. And it was a fairly expensive machine. We actually got a grant from the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation's Office of Environmental Justice to purchase one. So we are, are using that to try and remove some of the barriers that communities might be facing towards knowing more about what is in their soil. And what we're finding, and, and so we're taking samples from neighborhoods from all around and really looking at how that overlays with different socioeconomic layers. And not surprisingly, it's often lowering, lower income communities that have higher rates of lead contamination due to their proximity to industry, to pollution sources, but also the fact that you are less likely to have had responsible landowners who have done lead remediation, particularly on house paint, which is now flaking off and building up in the soil. So um, yeah, try, trying to get a sense of what's out there, but it's also letting people know uh, what's in their soil because it, it may be actually that their soil is perfectly fine mm -hmm. it's uh, or they might just have moderate lead levels and, and in case there's there's a lot that we can do right there I mean even just building raised garden beds mm -hmm. is a way that somebody can begin gardening right away if they have low levels of lead contamination because most annual vegetable roots don't go down deeper than six inches so if we build a 12 inch deep garden bed that's going to be a pretty safe way to avoid any lead contamination, particularly if we also do something like put down wood chips in between the garden beds that are going to prevent contaminated soil from from getting from turning into dust and landing on on surfaces. Um, 
and working with some other areas, we're actually working with some uh, groups at Prince Zero Polytechnic Institute that are really working to try and build a low cost and reliable lead testing machine that you know that more more people could re uh, realistically purchase and use to do this type of work because that's there's just so much of it that needs to get done. Uh, one organization alone isn't going to be able to. So that's that's also part of our work is to to work on that citizen science front as well. Okay. And then um, two questions that came in from Elizabeth. Uh, how did your group of 30 address racial injustice? And have you been able to convince your city officials to build green roads and walkways? So really conversations about racial injustice have been central to all of our discussions. We um, sort of an interesting mix. We have um, uh, the youth program, which is predominantly made up of youth of color. Uh, the AmeriCorps group was predominantly white. So it was sort of an interesting uh, balance between those different two different groups. And so we really tried to make questions about equity and racial injustice central to our work. And particularly in light of everything that's been going around right in the city of Albany, we're about a block away from the police precinct, which was really at the center of a lot of the Black Lives Matters protests. And they had constructed huge concrete barriers to actually block people's access to it. So it was, it's, it's really kind of create the, the setting to, uh, to a lot of our programming and our discussions. So really talking about everything from environmental justice to, to food justice to climate justice and really trying to base our work out of a spirit of solidarity where, you know, we don't necessarily, we are here as, as listeners. We're not coming in with the attitude that we have the solutions necessarily, but we're here to listen and to respond to the requests and taking leadership from the local community in particular is very important for us. And um, doing group readings, you know, a, a text that's been particularly useful to us is um, Lee Penniman's book, uh, Farming While Black, uh, having um, the youth lead uh, readings and discussions around that. So that's um, been really, uh, yeah, central uh, and of great importance mm -hmm. to, to our entire program. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards to um, having convincing the city to make green roads. Is that what the question was? Yes. Have you been able to convince your city officials to build green roads and walkways? Um, no. Uh, well, although they actually are putting in a pedestrian walkway that goes across Interstate 787, mm -hmm. um, they've done some pretty important work with creating bike paths to reconnect, particularly to reconnect people to um, to the riverway. Uh, our focus on that has really been the question of equity, right? And is asking, mm -hmm. well, which communities, which neighborhoods are going to be primarily served by those bike paths and those walkways and ensuring that there is focus on, on equitable distribution of mm -hmm. those things as well. Uh, short of that, the city hasn't been able to do too much. It's, it's an effectively a bankrupt city and they just, um, I mean, for instance, even the mayor is presently not drawing salary. So um, that's that's one of the challenges of working in a, a so-called shrinking city that, that really doesn't have the tax base to support that mm -hmm. type of infrastructural development. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from Karen, um, you have a comprehensive system going. Thinking back, what might be good first steps? So kind of looking in retrospect, um, maybe some things you have done better or done differently. I mean, I think for anybody considering doing any of this work and really whatever community they have happened to be in, uh, front loading as much, you really can't overemphasize the importance of, of just doing community outreach beforehand and being part of a place, being part of a community yourself, communicating with neighbors, talking about what your ideas are, listening to them, working with them and spending as much time as, as you can building support and familiarity with your plans and your ideas uh, beforehand. That is, that is really of, of, of the greatest importance and that, that would be my, my strongest recommendation, recommendation for anybody considering doing this type of work. Uh, on top of that, I, I, I'm a big believer in the idea of incrementalism, really just starting small 
and don't uh, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Really, mm-hmm. just um, start small and make small mistakes. Um, I think a, a big mistake people make too often is to to jump in head first and make a huge investment in a system that hasn't been tested and have it fail and then become discouraged from that. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, proceed, proceed slowly. I guess that would be my advice. Mm-hmm. Okay. And another question from Elizabeth, then we're going to open it up uh, for, for you all to um, directly answer, ask your questions. But Elizabeth has a question here. Are the white AmeriCorps people paid more than the youth? So based on your, your stipends, how does that work? Yeah. Um, you know, I actually think they are paid less. Um, I would have to sit down and do the math on that one. Um, but AmeriCorps is really regarded more of a, of a service position. Mm-hmm. So they receive a pretty minimal stipend. Uh, they receive an educational award at the end that they can use to pay back college debt. But um, it, I, th- I think that it works out to be actually less than minimum wage, whereas I think the youth are, are actually earning uh, minimum wage from the city of Albany. Mm, okay. Okay. And now that's all the questions in the chat. So I, I invite everyone, if you have a question, take yourself off of mute and uh, give your question to Scott and then just put yourself back on mute once you ask your question. So if there are any questions out there, feel free. And while folks are thinking about questions, um, you mentioned a little bit about some of the food distribution, some of the things that you're growing. How many gardens are you working with in Albany? Yeah, so there, the, the Radix has its main one center central garden and there are probably about seven or eight other gardens throughout the city that we help take care of, uh, and, and really that, that is in a minimal sort of way. Really the goal with those spaces is to help neighbors, the people living immediately around them to be gardening in them and to help them out with information or tools or resources or seeds or soil or whatever it, need, whatever it is that they need. Um, support with weeding, support with mowing and just help the, those, those neighbors to be actively working in those uh, spots. Um, there, we've been working this summer also in the Norman's Kill farm, which is a, um, about a 250 acre farm that's actually within the city of Albany that was deeded to the city that has a, a fairly large plot down by the river where we've, um, been able to do kind of more, more extensive agriculture, like growing cabbages and tomatoes and with the intention of really just trying to get that food into the local neighborhood. So, so a combination of working with gardeners and helping them to grow in the spaces that they do have access to, but also at the same time growing food and distributing, distributing that through various mechanisms into the, the local neighborhood, the local community. Mm-hmm. Okay. Scott, I have a question. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you got a grant from the DEC to get the equipment to test for lead and other. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you were thinking of developing a relationship with the DEC further, because one of their projects is they um, will declare different cities or municipalities as climate smart, and they have some guidance for um, cities and how to do that, what the cities have to do in order to rate, you know, officially as they've, they've made it to be ranked as climate smart, but nothing that they have in their literature covers food and agriculture, the kind of things that you are doing. So why don't you offer to them to write a guidance um, how um, municipalities could be climate smart in relation to raising food and training youth to raise food. Yeah, I would I would love to have that conversation with them. If you know anyone who works for the DC, who works for the Climate Smart Communities Program, I'd uh, love to have that conversation about ways that those considerations could be brought into doing assessments of 
Oh, climate resilience, and and at least I can I can I can address that at least on on a more local level, not so much a state level, but on a city level. I'm the chair of the Urban Agriculture Committee for the City of Albany Sustainability Advisory Committee, which I've been on for a number of years now. But um, they there's something similar to uh, climate smart uh, communities that they that they use. It's sort of a ranking and a scoring system that is comprised of a number of different metrics that are primarily based around uh, scoring for e efficiency uh, really and really the focus is a lot and this I sort of harkens back to one of my earlier slides about the sort of decentering of the social pillar of sustainability and, and a much larger emphasis on economic and technical aspects of it but um, and, and an aspect of what we might call carbon fundamentalism as well which is really to reduce climate change to a singular metric of greenhouse gas emissions, you know, or greenhouse gas equivalents such as carbon dioxide and methane, which are, are important and not to diminish the importance of that or of other gray infrastructural issues such as LED street lighting or, or, or low emissions vehicles or public transportation. Those are all important things, but it's a much bigger picture than that. And there's are other things that we want to account for. And like exactly like you mentioned, things like urban agriculture, which in my experience with the sustainability advisory committee was the attitude seemed to already just be like oh well that's that's nice you're doing that but that's not as important as mm, sewers or, or street lighting or, or things of that nature and i think what's interesting is that the coronavirus has drawn a lot more attention to the importance of food justice and food access and mm, sort of lifted it up in terms of um it's, it's prominence in, in discussions related to sustainability issues. So perhaps the time is right to have that broader conversation, but I would love, in, in, for instance, in, in coming up with all, Albany's own ranking for its, its own climate smart program would be to incorporate, for instance, how many greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced by growing fo food locally? Well, it's substantial. If you consider the considerable energetic inputs that go into growing food on an industrial model and then the distribution and the transportation of that if you're transporting foods transcontinentally into cities if we can grow that food locally that considerably cuts that out and then also something which isn't regarded very often which is the the potential to use vacant lots for carbon sequestration through soil carbon farming really just through good sustainable agricultural practices we can be sequestering a considerable amount of carbon out of the air and storing it in the soil. And that potential exists even in cities as well. So I um, yeah, I would really like to expand um, the, the notion of climate smart communities to also be in inclusive of, of notions of climate justice as well, which they may not be reducible to the same type of metrics, but somehow we need to account for that in that process. Okay. Wow, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Anyone else has a have a question that they would like to pose? And um, Joe has one. Thank you for this one. What are you doing for the Albany urban gardeners? What are some of their needs? So yeah, um, all of our work is really in in the south end of Albany, which is is very much an urban neighborhood. So. Uh, the gardens that I mentioned earlier that we're really trying to connect neighbors to those spaces and and help them gain access to it and you know that comes in a lot of different forms and it, it may be the fact that there's a space that somebody's interested in gardening in uh, that we might be able to help them go through the process of trying to gain legal access to one the albany actually has a land bank which is an entity that's been created to take vacant properties and ostensibly is tasked with trying to put those into the hands of local residents. So uh, one of the things that we do is to um, make people aware of some of the programs that the land maker has and, and try and offer them guidance about how to navigate through that pretty heavily bureaucratic process. They even have something new called a mow to own program where if you take care of a parcel of land for a year and keep it you know, cut the grass and pick up the trash, they will, after a year, give it to you and then give you $1,000 on top of that as well. And that's really just for Albany residents. 
So that can help on the end of, of gaining access to land, which is a fundamental issue, land access and land rights uh, all throughout, I mean, the history of the world, but particularly this country as well. So um, information, you know, if people just are interested in gardening but don't are, aren't super confident in their own skills, talking about providing advice, you know, either over the phone or, or over Zoom conferences such as this or in person about how to do that. Um, seeds are a big one. We got a huge donation of seeds last fall. Everything that was left over uh, from the uh, the previous growing season that we put into storage. And as it turned out, this March, seeds were incredibly scarce. Uh, there was a panic buying of seeds and they were very difficult to buy. So we um, made those seeds available to the local community and also got a lot of them started in, um, in buckets and helped deliver bucket gardens um, around to, to residents who were interested in growing vegetables, even on just uh, their front stoops where they might have uh, minimal access to space, but helping them get started in, in those ways. So those are, those are some of the examples of ways we've been working on urban gardening. My name is Joe, and I asked this last question. And uh, what most gardeners need is to learn how to garden. I find so much ignorance of how to garden. Assumptions that they don't need the space, say, for something like carrots. So they plant in a four by 10, they plant uh, an acre's worth of carrots or tomato plants or things like that. And the only way you find out these problems is by going to these gardens. Uh, it's not a matter of one centralized place where there are high goals uh, about sustainability and other uh, kind of abstract words and that. You got to go to the gardens. Uh, do you go and visit gardens and find out the same problem? One of the things that we offer are open garden hours that we advertise where people, for instance, who are interested in gardening or want to learn more about it can come to the gardens at posted open hours and come in and, and see the gardens and learn about how to garden themselves. So yeah, exactly everything that you're we talking about, we try and make that something that is available to the local community. My question is, do you go to the gardens and see that all these ideas of yours on how to be a good gardener are carried out? If you, you were, your eyes would be opened if you went to the gardens yourself. I'm in the gardens myself uh, from Monday to Thursday from eight to noon. Yep. That, uh, that's a, a good question as I work with that as well here in Springfield. So Joe, thank you for that uh, follow-up question. Um, there's a question that came in, Scott, concerning uh, funding. Uh, someone's asking, uh, does your organization get any support from state or local government and how do you sustain the organization? Yeah, so we really try and have a diversified economic survival Pyramid, I guess you could think of it, and really at the base of it, all along we've really tried to have sustainable micro industries at the bottom. So things like the compost collection business and uh, a farm share of the CSA. We've been uh, running a, a, a farmers market, what's actually called the night market, in conjunction with a village, who's a partner organization of ours, that bring in not a ton of income, but somewhat reliable income that allows us to at least be growing vegetables and to be processing food wastes and turning those oil, those wastes back into soil that we in turn use to grow the food. And at that most basic level, our educational programs are integrated into those two things. So that way, if everything else were to fall through, we could hopefully still land on just that and be able to sustain those basic operations. Um, we make a little bit additional income off of having university groups come for tours who have the budget to be able to pay for, for those types of experiences. Uh, the whole idea is that then we can then provide free educational programming for local public schools. 
uh, which is really our nonprofit charitable mission. So that's what we really try and have at the base of things. Any additional funding that we get from grants or from other sources would pay for programs that are above and beyond that. Um, we try not to be too overly grant reliant as you know, we've seen really even just since the beginning of the coronavirus that when there's any kind of economic downturn, uh, nonprofits suffer pretty heavily as a result of that. So we've unfortunately had to sort of shift the emphasis of a lot of our programming to be less about education and more about food, emergency food production, which um, I believe in both. I believe in doing both. Um, a lot of the, the it's, it's unfortunate that educational programs aren't regarded as being as important as, as food production. I mean, they're both important and I, I, I don't, it's unfortunate that we have to be making a choice between the two of them. But we've been luckily been able to integrate the youth program, for instance, into the process of food production and getting food out to the community so that there is still a strong educational component to that work. And um, there's also, interestingly, um, different sources of emergency funding that have been made available uh, since the coronavirus that uh, are, are designed to meet the needs of communities, especially when it comes to food access and food security. So it's a um, it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a stressful time for for everyone, but particularly for nonprofits. And uh, yeah, something that we're trying to adapt to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a question came in concerning more of your youth programming. Could you describe some more about the youth program? Sure. So we've been doing the youth program, I want to say for about five or six years now, we call it the Eco Justice Summer Program. And we've always really tried to have a balance of, you know, learning the garden, working in the garden, doing, helping maintain the various sustainability systems at Radix. Yeah, everything from taking care of the chickens to collecting eggs to watering the plants to uh, going and collecting food waste from the pantry and learning how to compost with uh, a lot of environmental justice education. So taking articles, news articles, articles from uh, sections from books, reading them collectively as a group and going through them line by line to understand what the core message of them is and relate back how that is relevant to local social and environmental issues. And we also try to have an element of fun in outdoor education that has had to be different this summer. In the past, we've gone and a big, a big thing that we'd like to emphasize is that you don't have to go out, outside of the city to experience nature and quote the environment, which is an idea that is common in a lot of environmental education, that the environment is something out there and that urban ecosystems or urban environments are less pure, less interesting, which um, is based on a lot of, um, uh, you know, I ideas about this sort of nature society dualism. And it's really been one of the insights of the environmental justice movement is to extend the definition of quote, the environment to include social and human processes. So we really try and take that to heart and learn a lot about the ecosystems that are that are right around us that are within walking distance to where a lot of our youth live, which is a huge part of locating where we are to be as accessible as possible, particularly to elementary schools. We're within walking distance of two different elementary schools so they can have repeat visits and see how the space changes and evolves over a sustained period of time. When kids come once, that's great but they're getting a snapshot of a system that's going through a lot of transformation throughout the year. So those two different elementary schools were also around the, um, about a block away from the children's South end cafe, which is sort of a drop-in center for elementary school kids who will come once, twice a week. And it's just a space that they can be familiar with where they can interact with the chickens, with the, with the fish, learn about all the li different living systems there. So, um, yeah, we've gone on in the summer program, uh, 
Peebles Island, which is a, um, a location just a little bit to the north of Albany where we've gone and uh, gone on kayaking trips, let uh, ex- explore really kind of more peri-urban waterways. Uh, we've done, I've actually got some of the pictures here still, um, releases of floating islands, which are these things that we construct out of um, tubing and mesh where we uh, attach water plants to them and they're designed to uh, clean up polluted waterways. Here we are actually launching some into the Hudson River that we attach to a, uh, a floating dock that bubbled oxygen underneath the roots of the plants to support the microbes living there. And these were designed to clean up um, sewage resulting from sewage overflows and is a way to like push back on the narrative that things, places like the Hudson River are hopelessly polluted and that they're not worth trying to save. We want to show kids in particular that there are steps you could take towards cleaning up the river using simple and affordable processes and really engaging them in that process. Having them be co-creators, co-designers, having it all be participatory where you see here them actually like attaching the water plants to the islands themselves and then getting them to drag out into the water. And, you know, was this having a huge impact on water quality? No, it's primarily symbolic and educational, but in as much, that's very powerful. Just to show kids that it's possible to do something to give them some kind of hope and a feeling of love and connection with something like a waterway, which they may not have had the opportunity to uh, develop a relationship with previously. So um, this summer has been a little more challenging, mostly because we haven't been able to do carpooling because of coronavirus and a lot of the kids can't get rides other ways to some of the, f- the further out locations but we've still been able to go through the norman's kill we took them on a trip to uh to tivoli park which is another large uh park in the city of albany where they keep sheep and alpacas to uh, manage vegetation on them so letting the kids learn about those systems and experiencing that so in that way kind of yeah a, com- a fun a combination of gardening education Environmental, and just environmental justice education and outdoor exploration and fun. Okay, thank like you. To, that was a great question. Go ahead. Can I, this is Chris Roy. I'd like to just ask a very basic question about lead, lead contaminated soils. Um, I'm putting myself in a position of like one of the people, one of the, uh, you know, where you've gone out and tested someone's uh, lawn or whatever and found that it's lead contaminated. I, I'm in that situation and I'm thinking, okay, I mean that what everyone says is you build a raised bed, but it's the whole lawn. And so I'm thinking, oh, I want to like strip the sod and bring in lots of, um, um, you know, loam and compost. And, but then what do you do with the sod and, you know, that, that's contaminated. So when you've tested someone's lawn and it's contaminated, uh, other than, well, build a raised bed, do you have other recommendations uh, to help them figure out what to do next? Um, do you typically say just leave everything in place and build up from there? Or w- what, what are other sort of uh, solutions that you suggest? Yeah, it really depends on the levels. And that's why having some good numbers about that can really inform our decisions about what steps to take. So, there's the way lead concentrations are, are measured in parts per million and 400 ppm is sort of often used as kind of the dividing line between safe fur and not safe and it's it's the language around it is very tricky because the department of health in particular is, is is very careful to never refer to soil is safe, they use the term safer, which um, they don't want to give people, I don't know, a false sense of security. But um, really depending on what the levels are, you know, if it's 200 parts per million or less, it's generally regarded as being safe for vegetable production. And there's, and the thing is, there's also different people who are more vulnerable than others. Yeah, let's say it's Young over 400 are, parts per million. I mean, it's clear, it's not good to plant anything that's edible in it, you know, and that came, that happened to me in the Berkshires, it happened to my son in uh, Providence in town, 
Uh, we're both faced with the same problem. There must be people all over Albany where you're testing the soil. They've got lead at unsafe levels. And uh, just, so beyond just building a raised bed. Uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Right, and sometimes we do test and we found numbers as high into the multiple thousands in, in certain locations in terms of parts per million, astronomically high levels. And when there may be instances when they are so astronomically high that you do have to unfortunately result to what's called dig and dump, where those soils are just excavated in landfill. And is that just moving the problem one, one place to another? Yeah. Um, Arguably better to have it in a sealed landfill than in the top few inches of soil where kids could get into it. But in between, there's, um, you know, there's some gray space. And in addition to raised beds, like you mentioned, another fantastic reason for adding compost is to neutralize the soil. Lead is soluble under acidic conditions. Lead is it's funny, I mean, it's a literal heavy metal. And when you really are precise with, with testing, you'll see that levels can vary enormously from two feet in one direction or another. And that you might have a very high concentration here and then two feet over here have almost none at all. Um, and that's because it tends to just sort of stay where it falls and stick to that soil. And under pH neutral conditions, it's not particularly mobile and it may not be uptaken into plant tissues at all. So one of the best things that you can do is just try and neutralize your pH, prevent it from becoming mobile, add compost so that the lead actually gets bound up in its molecular structure and is less biologically available to both animals and to plants, build in raised beds like you mentioned to uh, get vegetable roots away from it, putting down a ground cover such as wood chips or even gravel, to prevent lead contaminated soil from becoming dried out and dust borne and landing on the surfaces. Uh, constructing aerial deposition barriers around the perimeters of gardens is really important. Really any kind of vining plant on a fence with surface area is gonna trap a lot of the street dust blowing off the road, originating from wearing brake pads and just a lot of the, the dust in roadways tends to have high concentrations of metals in it. Um, so yeah, those, those are some of the examples, I think, beyond raised, uh, beds that you can use to, uh, tree lead. And then just also sort of, you know, common sense practices like washing your vegetables, really, if they are grown in like a damage soil, because probably the greatest, the largest route of exposure next to direct ingestion, like in the case of babies, kids eating soil is what you're actually getting off the surface of the plant. So root vegetables, carrots, potatoes, scrubbing them really well, but even uh, leafy greens, washing them as well because you can have lead dust on their surfaces. So yeah, I hope that's helpful. I hope that yeah, is. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. And I see Elizabeth um, has a question for us. Elizabeth, you're off mute. Uh -huh. No, I really didn't have a question. Okay. I was just commenting on the contamination of the Hudson. I don't yeah. know if you could read that little story that I wrote in the chat, but. Sure, yeah. actually I will, I will do that unless you would like to yeah, repeat I can, it. My, yes, feel free. My dentist was also a fisherman and there was a whole group of fishermen who like to fish in the Hudson and they watched what was going on there and they discovered that the big oil tankers from Venezuela would deliver their oil. Then they would wash the hull out with river water and then go a little farther upstream, fill the tanker with water and take it back down to Latin America where they would sell it as clean water. So they were able to put an end to that practice. Yeah. The river's unfortunately got a long history of abuse uh, that it really has been treated as a, an open sewer, as, as a free service for, for industry to externalize their waste products by dumping them in the river. And while, you know, it's got, it's got a long way to go, it, it, I think it, it, to me it's very heartening to know that it has improved, especially in the past 30 and 40 years since the enaction of the Clean Water Act, you'll 
talk to older people who've been fishing on the river for decades and they'll say, yeah, it may not be great now, but it's a lot better than it was back in the 1960s, for instance, where you would know what color paint the local uh, auto plant was using because it would turn the, the water that color. So um, that, a lot of that direct dumping of industrial wastes has, has been slowed. Um, we still have a lot of work to do with preventing combined sewage overflows from preventing sewage from getting dumped into it. And um, while I'm glad that re remediative action has been taken on the part of the federal government to clean up the PCBs, uh, we still need to go further with that. I'm, I'm, I'm with the DEC on that level and that we need to go even further to try and clean up some of those remaining hotspots of, uh, of PCBs in the sediments. And that I really hope in my lifetime to once again have the river be swimmable and fishable, which was, um, you know, going back to um, the first slide that Anna showed of uh, the indigenous tribes in the area. I mean, this river sustained so many people for thousands of years and just within uh, such a short period of time has been poisoned and what a travesty is that is. But we really need to do the work of regenerating it, bringing the life back into it. And I believe that can be done. Thank you for that. Um, and that was a great story. Um, it's always nice to know how things got to be. So Elizabeth, thank you so much. Um, we still have time to take additional questions. So if there are any other questions out there, please take yourself off of mute and uh, ask Scott your question. What time are we going until, I'm sorry? 6.30, you have uh, uh, okay, until 6.30, yes, so. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I can actually show a couple other slides then. Um, sure. We're also big advocates of rainwater harvesting, which is the practice of catching rainwater off of rooftops. Uh, here we are catching water off the roof of our greenhouse storing it in, in barrels and using that inside for all manner of purpose of irrigation, for animals, for plants. Rainwater is one of the cleanest types of water there is. The hydrological cycle, which is the process of water evaporating off the ocean and coming down again as rain, is a purification process. So many of the impurities you would find in surface or groundwater are not gonna be present in rain. And it's also non-chlorinated which is particularly important when we are dealing with fish or organic gardening, the goal of which to culture healthy and diverse microbial populations in soil. If we're using chlorine, which is a microbicide, it's harming those bacteria. And to some degree, we're working against ourselves. So rainwater is a really fantastic source to have. And it also can do a lot towards reducing the severity and the impact of combined sewage overflows as well. We were talking about impervious covers before, but a lot of those are on the rooftops of buildings themselves. So if we're able to capture that water off of, when it flows off of rooftops and store it in a barrel and release it slowly over time, we can reduce the, what's called the flashiness of the urban watershed. So uh, another, another toolkit in our strategies. And, also, when it comes to guarding on vacant lots, another uh, significant obstacle is, is having access to water because even getting a water line connection in a vacant lot can cost $3,000 upwards of. So many times rainwater collection may be the only option that we have. And one of the things that we actually will do is um, set up sort of a inverted satellite dish that acts like a bowl that's standing on legs that would stand across a 55 gallon barrel like this to kind of act as a rainwater collection uh, catchment area that would drain into a barrel and then have it be available for people who want to be gardening where there is no water line otherwise because as we know you can have the healthy soil in the world but if they become slightly uh, water stress, then, then all bets are off as far as their vulnerability to disease and illness. And also where you have community members carrying five gallon jugs of water, extremely labor intensive. So 
being able to have that water be right there for them uh, is, is helping to remove one of the barriers to growing food. Um, we teach a lot about wastewater purification as well. And this is actually a constructed wetland system that is designed to be filtering water from a washing machine. And the washing machine would be located behind it and pump its water upwards and it would flow through these bathtubs that would all be filled with gravel. Bacteria on the roots of the plants would break down the wastes that were present in the washing machine water and purifying it. So that by the time that it came out, it had been clean, you could just use to go directly into a gardens um, or right into the ground itself. So talking about the potential for reuse of gray water, uh, bees are a huge part of our system as well. We are big advocates of the concept of biocultural diversity, which is about trying to link social justice with biodiversity conservation, because these two are also movements which historically have been thought up of separate and sometimes even at odds with one another. Um, really what our goal is, is to show how it's possible and even desirable to engage in food production and biodiversity conservation simultaneously. And for us, honeybees are a great way to, to demonstrate that, where the linkage is very clear between bees and pollinators and, and food production. So a great teaching tool for kids um, and opens the, the discussion for the role of pollinators as a whole, because really their primary ser uh, service on our property is to be just that as pollinators, the honey is really secondary to that, but to uh, be creating habitat for non honey producing pollinating insects as well in different insect hotels that we construct or various forms of habitat for them around the properties. Uh, it's, it's a really important part of the, uh, the educational system that we have, but even just removing combs from the beehives and letting kids taste raw honey is a fantastic thing for to be doing. Here are some of the, the structures that can be built that will create habitat for native pollinating insects on the inside. Um, pigeons are another important component of our system as a way to teach about urban biodiversity and bi uh, or biocultural diversity. I mean, the pigeons actually share this is not a photo of our site, this is a stone dove coat, but it's similar to a system that we have constructed at Radix where the pigeons actually share roosting quarters with the chickens. And we like to demonstrate both of them side by side as being sort of parallel strategies with chickens being more of an intensive strategy where we are bringing food to them and getting large numbers of eggs or manure in return. With the pigeons, in the process of being domesticated, they never lost the ability to feed themselves. So they're actually free to come and go. They will fly out during the day and forage for food, then return to radix and deposit their manures that we then use as fertilizer on the property. And they're also just great teaching tool for kids who grew up around pigeons, but they're um, often highly maligned uh, bird species for no real good particular re uh, reason. They're often considered to be rats with wings, really just on account of the fact that there are too many of them, this perception that there are too many of them, when really just what they are doing are, is responding to the ecological conditions that have been created for them in cities. And pigeons, interestingly, sort of chose to domesticate themselves more than they were actually domesticated by humans. They, their, origin, their native habitats are rocky outcroppings in Northern Africa and the Middle East. And some of the first human cities that were built were occupied by pigeons who took advantage of literal pigeon holes in the sides of buildings to take advantage of reduced predation. And the humans partnership with them shortly came afterwards. So the pigeons we see in cities today are actually feral meaning they're the descendants of once domesticated birds, but we can still have a 
reciprocal kind of what I would call a semi wild relationship with them. And um, we're not going to get as much from them in terms of meat or eggs as we would for chickens, but um, is a good way to demonstrate sort of intensive versus extensive strategies. Um, Scott, a real quick question, if you don't mind. Um, sure, how many how many people work at the Radix Center? Including our youth. Um, Probably close to 30 at this point. Yeah. Um, this is, these are silkworms, which are another teaching tool that we use with the youth. They are an insect that while in its larval state, which you see here only eats one thing, which is the mulberry tree, which we have an abundance of surrounding Radix and in the whole neighborhood. And they eat those mulberry leaves and grow rapidly and turn from a tiny little caterpillar into a big three inch caterpillar in a matter of um, three weeks or so, after which they can be used as a food for chickens or for fish. Uh, we don't actually harvest silk from them. Uh, it's, it's a very labor intensive process. It's, it's more just a way to demonstrate relationships with novel ecosystems and particularly mulberry trees, which um, we have an interesting relationship with. We have the number of them planted all over the property that are producing berries for, for eating. They are a great shade tree for the chickens, but also the leaves that are used to, uh, to feed to the silkworms. And cool way just for kids to overcome fear of, of insects if they have them because the silkworm isn't gonna crawl away, it doesn't bite. You can just hold them in their hand. They then hatch into finally a uh, flightless white moth, which uh, that's proof of the extent to which they've been domesticated. Probably silkworms and honeybees are the two most domesticated insects. And they, um, if we time it right, we can get a second batch of eggs out of them that we'll then put in the refrigerator over the winter months and then take out again in the fall to uh, to begin the next generation of them. Um, one of the other things that just reminded me that we do with the youth in the winter months in the past two years is actually a maple syrup tapping program where we've gotten a permit from the city of Albany to be tapping trees in Lincoln Park, which is a large park that borders us as a great way to teach an ethic of reciprocity and the idea of urban forest justice to kids where it's about mutual respect, respect with the trees that we are taking something from them, but we're also then motivated to work in their protection and their defense. So past few years, we've yeah started around probably in early February or so, and we go out and we tap the trees and the kids use the drill, insert the taps, collect the sap, bring them down to the rag center, and we build a hearth out of concrete blocks and boil the sap down 90% and then finish it off in a wood stove. And then we are able to sell the syrup throughout the year at farmer's markets and as part of their CSA. And um, yeah, train the um, youth in, in the process of running a small business, a little micro industry. And we've actually done, going back to, to lead, we've done screening on that syrup, comparing it to a control taken from the Adirondacks and it actually turned out that the Albany syrup had lower levels of most metals than, than the control did in the Adirondacks. So that was kind of interesting because that was a concern of mine was, you know, what can, um, contaminants might potentially be in sap of maple trees. Um, but also going back to uh, silkworms and you know, teaching about the local history of it, there was actually in the 19th century, a workers' cooperative in just outside of Northampton, Massachusetts, that was a silkworm factory. They were actually raising silkworms as uh, an industry. And um, interestingly, uh, yeah, Sojourner Truth was a member of that workers' cooperative and planted mulberry trees all throughout that region. So there is 
a precedent for people doing it at this latitude. Um, and remain a viable industry until really later in the 20th century when it was outcompeted by synthetic fabrics in the rayon industry. This is our duck-a-poop-a-ponic system, which is a way that we raise, uh, it's a way to turn duck wastes into food for ducks. Um, ducks, we have a number of them actually living with our chickens and they love to swim. Problem is they really foul up their water rather quickly. Uh, so instead of just dumping it out every day, what we've done is connect a pump to it and have that water flow through, I don't know if you all can see my cursor, but it goes up into this metal trough where it flows through the roots of floating plants like water lettuce and water hyacinth who use the duck waste as a nutrient source and grow prolifically and then purify the water and then returns to them. And then we'll periodically pull those floating pants, plants out and feed them back to the duck. So it's kind of a way to create green fodder for them while at the same time demonstrating the process of biological wastewater treatment. Um, we Similarly to aquaponics, the big difference is that in this sort of system, we wouldn't want to grow food for human consumption because you don't want to grow, you don't want to eat vegetables that are grown out of um, the manures of warm blooded animals. We can get away with that with fish because they're cold blooded. Um, yeah, any final questions? Anybody has? So as um, we begin to wrap up, um, if there's any final questions, I'm going to be pl placing some things in the chat as it relates to other things that's going on at the summer conference. Um, we'd love for everyone to visit the vendors. So there's a link for that. You'll see it there. Um, to participate in the teacup rally that helps fundraise for the scholarships. We have some youth um, members that have taken advantage of those scholarships to see the whole conference live. Um, we also have our evaluation. We would love for you to evaluate our workshops and our overall conference. And don't forget Saturday, this Saturday at 7 p.m. we have our keynote speaker, Tim LaSalle, uh, starting at 7 p.m. He's gonna be um, speaking our keynote, so you don't wanna miss that. Um, if there are any additional comments, Scott, is there anything coming up, any additional things you would like us to know about the Radix Center? Any different events you all possibly have coming up? It's a really challenging time uh, when it comes to events and, and having open hours. Um, with in just the era of the of the pandemic and figuring out how to adapt to these new challenges um, and what's being allowed to happen as it changes really every single day. And we've ha even having a long conversation about how we're going to be carrying on our youth programming this fall. And it's one thing to be doing it outdoors in the summer months when it's warm, but what happens when the temperature starts to drop and people are beginning to move indoors um, is, um, yeah, we re we're really not sure. So we really need to have multiple contingencies for that. We've been discussing even just trying to get funds to purchase insulated coveralls for for youth participants so that they can wear them and then we can have fires outdoors and just be spending more of our time outside. Um, we, interestingly, are, we received funding from the DEC to build an environmental justice classroom two years ago that's finally gotten underway this summer, um, even despite the coronavirus. Uh, we're uncertain though whether we're gonna be able to use that classroom this fall as, as that's still kind of up in the air. So trying to really, um, you know, be flexible and have the adaptive capacity to be able to change, change to a very fluid and fast moving situation, taking the lead from the local schools and, and seeing what they're doing, but trying to maintain our connections with our, with our youth as much as we're able to. And when coronavirus first hit, that was, everything was really first moved online which is, um, it's great, it's better than nothing. It's great to be able to maintain that connection, but really there's a whole deeper learning that comes in for kids and especially being mindful of the digital divide that many of our youth don't have access to reliable internet connections. 
So it's not even that going online may exclude them from that process as well. So trying to figure out that balances and we've been, you know, started by just sort of bringing them back individually in small groups until we've sort of gotten comfortable with protocol for social distancing and hand washing and mask wearing. And um, we're really learning from this process, which is, I think is really important because we don't know how long the pandemic is going to be with us. And we really want environmental education to continue. I'm a big believer in multiple intelligence, multiple intelligence theory, which is the idea that um, people learn in different ways. And in the schools, there's a lot of emphasis on listening and watching, but that some people are learned by touching, by tasting, by movement, by doing. And um, online education can be can be very difficult for for students who who enjoy a lot of movement and, and physical activity as well. So trying to make sure that the possibilities remain open for them. So once the world returns to quote normal, whenever that is or if, I would love to have you all come and visit. We previously were doing open houses on a monthly basis. Uh, that's had to be suspended because of coronavirus, but hopefully soon that will return. But in the meantime, in the, in the meantime and in the interim, if anybody has any questions, uh, please contact me and I'd be happy to talk more. Our website is Radix Center, R-A-D-I-X Center.org. And you can contact me or anybody on the team through there. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Scott. This was such a wonderful workshop, very informative. As you can tell, we've had a very uh, substantial track on urban soils, um, particularly as it relates to racial justice. We had um, Ibrahim Ali last week talking about the work in the Mason Square area where I live. Here in Springfield, we've had discussions. Um, Saturday, we had a great workshop around including urban um, agriculture and um, urban design. So this has been a big track and we are very grateful for uh, so many of you who have come to this workshop and the others. So uh, again, I put some links in to go visit vendors, to go uh, participate in a teacup rally to take the survey uh, or the evaluation. Scott, many thanks for your time today. You all have a big schedule and a lot of great work. So at this time, I want to uh, give everyone that quick dinner break because at 7 p.m. we come right back here and the other workshop rooms for some great workshops. I think in this room, we're gonna be having farming and gardening on the wild side, and you wanna check that out. So thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. And thank you to everyone um, for coming out and visiting with us. See you soon. Have a great night. Thanks.